You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia. For more information, please visit pasnia.com. Today I have the second and final part of these Bill Cooper uh, Hour of the Time shows, and uh, maybe the official launch of the Health Liberation Self Liberation series. I uh, just thought of, uh, thought of that today, actually. Um, after uh, the release of that uh, that first episode, but uh, the subject is the uh, fraud known as AIDS, and I suppose more generally speaking, of germ theory. Uh, of course, the fear of AIDS was primarily in the 80s and 90s, and these episodes were originally released on November 30th and December 1st, 1993, respectively. Uh, but there are some interesting overlaps with what is transpiring today. For one, Dr. Anthony Fauci was involved uh, peddling the super toxic pharmaceutical AZT. Um, Alex Loglia, or I guess I think his name is Alex, Alex Loglia, mentions, uh, mentions, mentions Fauci by name once um, near the end of the ep- episode, too. Um, additionally, the main issues with uh, germ theory are obviously at the forefront again, uh, hence these episodes, uh, specifically the lack of fulfilling of, uh, of Cox postulates, uh, not properly isolating slash purifying the virus, uh, garbage tests with really high false positive rates, uh, or are otherwise super inaccurate, and uh, fear-mongering media. Uh, things really really haven't changed, except the mind control is stronger and uh, I guess the propaganda is really, really unavoidable. Uh, Both of these examples also highlight modern medicine's total misunderstanding of disease and the disease process and the servile society's disconnect from cause and effect. Uh, Then again, Rockefeller Inc. doesn't make money off of an accurate accurate and uh, demonstrable cause of disease. Uh, So I guess there's, uh, there's that. Please excuse the Matt Times questionable audio. Uh, Keep in mind, this was 1993 and was probably ripped from a cassette tape. Uh, As with the last episode, I'm sure Fascist Book and Friends are going to crush this one, Uh, so please do consider sharing. VaniPodcast.com slash 87 is part one. Tonight's is VaniPodcast.com forward slash 88. Thanks in advance, and please enjoy. Folks, we're back again. Third installment on a little series I'm doing here on germ theory and AIDS. Tonight's topic, we are going to begin with AIDS. Now, you even mention this word today and people get scared. Well, fear not, folks. Hopefully, after hearing tonight's show, you will be a lot less scared. And I'll have saved you a lot of trouble, a lot of anguish, a lot of fear related to this hoax called AIDS. I'm going to draw heavily tonight again from the works of Dr. Bill Holub, um, who has been telling America basically since 1984 that AIDS is not at all what it seems. His work, his seminal work on AIDS, uh, a compendium that's about 50, 60 pages, has about four or 500 references in it. Um, in fact, even more than that. It's one of the most well-documented pieces of scholarship I've ever seen, and I'm not going to bother to read you all those references, but I am going to read you uh, some excerpts from that piece of work because after hearing it, I am sure you will change your opinion on this disease, this alleged disease called AIDS. I'm reading from the work of Dr. Bill Hollum. Multifactorial damage, not HIV. The percent of people theoretically exposed to the virus who subsequently develop AIDS is very small. It is about 1%. This fact and many other pieces of information strongly support the role of many cofactors contributing to immune suppression. With the immense number of cofactors already indicated, it is clear that AIDS cannot possibly be caused by HIV. However, the cofactor scenario cannot make as large profits for the medical pharmaceutical complex, as does the HIV hypothesis, because their formula is HIV, medication, and death. Now, folks, cofactor simply refers to cofactors, other things involved in producing acquired immune deficiency syndrome outside of 
the, the virus. Thus, susceptibility, as defined as poor health, is the major factor in AIDS and not microbes. In a well-referenced work by Drs. Patrick Donovan and Herb Joyner Bay, many obvious documented susceptibility factors are described, including many concurrent infections, antibiotic use, malnutrition, food tolerance, malabsorption syndrome, stress, smoking, and in parentheses, we see that Philip Morris is increasing the marketing of Marlboro's to the gay community, lack of sleep and exercise, etc. This cofactor concept is supported by many in the area of AIDS research. For example, receiving any blood products, transfusions, protein factors, allergy shots, gamma globulin shots, protein hormones, etc. are specifically and dramatically immunosuppressive. Actually, immunosuppression is a synonym for poor health. While we cannot go into this in depth here, you must understand that the immune system is poorly understood by many in the health care field. The immune system is not a system, and it does not fight the bad guys, germs, cancer cells, etc. The immune system is actually a group of cells, white blood cells, and their associated organs, circulatory, lymphatic, and other systems. The actual job of the white blood cell is not the exciting, romantic, pentagon-like soldier function of fighting the enemy, as I had told you in one of the previous shows, folks, but is rather the boring, necessary job of building and maintaining your body. Thus, white cells are far more like janitors than a SWAT team. In the case of AIDS, you can discount another word as not accurately describing what is happening. We have established that AIDS is not acquired. And now we can tell you that AIDS is not an immunodeficiency, at least not until modern medicine treats it. The person diagnosed with AIDS actually has a hyperactive and competent immune system. Their immune system is very capable of producing all the necessary healing reactions, such as fever, swollen lymph nodes, high antibody titers, etc. These are all indications of an active immune system cleaning up toxic damage. Now, remember what I mentioned on the last shows in the germ theory, folks. The disease is the cure. What modern medicine has labeled disease is your body in the process of eliminating toxins. And this is exactly what Bill Hollib is saying in reference to AIDS. These are all indications of an active immune system cleaning up toxic damage. When medicine, quote-unquote, treats that person and or if that person continues a toxic, self-damaging lifestyle, then their health and their ability to heal is what actually becomes deficient. They are actually deficient in good health advice, something you unfortunately cannot get from modern medicine. AIDS is not transmitted. Of course, AIDS was claimed to be sexually transmitted. If you claim that a disease is specific to a certain sexual lifestyle, then you are saying that it is sexually transmitted. If one accused, if one accused gays of having this quote-unquote new disease, then it was a gay sex that caused the disease. One of their proofs was that the men with AIDS had 1,100 sexual partners per lifetime, about 10 to 15 years, and their control group, without AIDS, had 500 sexual partners per lifetime. Therefore, sexual promiscuity caused the transmission of the disease, allegedly. But you have to ask an obvious question. If anyone sought out homosexual or heterosexual relationships in such numbers, averaging two different ones per week, and if each encounter involved drugs and medications, then they are obviously not having nourishing sex and do not have a healthy lifestyle. Having a malnourishing lifestyle has nothing to do with sexual preferences. Anyone can have a malnourishing lifestyle. All you have to do, and this is the consistent history in all AIDS persons, is eat poorly, use drugs, medications, have unloving malnourishing sex, be medically treated for chronic ailments, have poor emotional spiritual inputs, etc. So it's not the number of sexual partners you have, but rather how nourishing is your sex life. Remember that food and sex are the core of human nature, and both are necessary inputs for human health. In a Good Review article, a very astute gay observed that a very homophobic culture created, quote, a disease for which supposedly the cure is to go back to all the styles that were preached at us in the first place. Another offered proof was that anal sex was a factor, because sperm pumped into a rabbit's anus, which was 
an unnecessarily and horrible experiment, cause antibodies in their blood, and that could suppress immunity. Now, this typical example of bad science was, of course, poorly designed with absolutely no controls. And I will have you know, ladies and gentlemen, that recent searches for HIV-1 in semen have proved absolutely fruitless. That's right. They cannot find HIV-1 in semen. Another supposed proof showed that a large percent of homosexuals showed antibodies to the alleged AIDS virus when anal intercourse was practiced. Now, once again, the bad science indicated in this report showed many other differences between the groups which could explain the disparity and no controls were run. In any case, other studies showed no antibodies to sperm in AIDS patients and no correlation between promiscuity and positive AIDS antibodies. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you remember the little piece I read you from Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park a couple of shows ago, because you're going to come to find, if you take the time to research the actual studies that have been done on AIDS, that there are a bunch of uh, maybe well-intentioned scientists out there, maybe not, doing experiments to prove things that they want to prove and not doing objective science. And that's going to become more and more clear to you as I read on tonight. Getting back to Bill Holland. Sexual transmission of AIDS has not been proven. Condoms have a relatively high rate of failure for preventing pregnancy, for which they were designed. And even if the virus was involved, condoms could not prevent transmission. And that's a fact you can check out in any of the research. They have already shown that the so-called AIDS virus exists in all body fluids, so they would have to outlaw all human contact. Now, it's common clinical knowledge when someone has suppressed immunity that all sorts of microorganisms and germs will grow on them but they are not the cause, but rather they are the consequence of immune depression. Believe it or not, they are there to help you. The issue over whether germs are causes or consequences of disease is very lengthy. We feel that germs are a consequence of the single disease called malnourishment and that they are more likely to be trying to participate in repair and regeneration of the host than in killing or harming the host. In any case, AIDS has a plethora of germs involved, and any one or more of them could be equally labeled the cause. Any germ would have sufficed as the, quote, cause of AIDS, but a new disease requires a new germ for new research money, and that is the crux of what we're talking about here, ladies and gentlemen. Thus, the 35 or so equally qualified germ candidates were passed over as a hunt for a new germ was and is subsidized. Opportunistic germs are supposedly those germs that proliferate in order to take over a host during an illness. Then, all germs could easily be considered opportunistic, including the AIDS virus. The alleged specificity of the HIV-1 infecting T cells and causing a decrease in helper suppressor T cells is also true for almost every other germ. Now, folks, you, if you ever have even uh, come across anybody doing AIDS testing, the first thing they do is they give you an antibody test. And the next thing they do is give you a T-cell count. Now listen to what we're saying here, folks. All the research that we are showing here and it has come across me and that has come across to the work that Bill Holland has done. Any germ, practically, will show a T-cell decrease. That is true for most germs. A low T-cell count, which is one of the corollary symptoms that we find for AIDS is nonsense. It can be caused by almost anything. Now, remember that many germs could do all the same things that are claimed for the so-called AIDS virus. They are the result and not the cause according to the logic of Sutton's law. And let's remember when Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, was asked why he robbed banks, he replied, because that's where the money is. Quote, sick germs grow in sick people because that's where the ideal environment is. Now, remember what I said about germs over the last couple of shows. Well germs grow in well people because that's where their ideal environment is. We change germs from well to sick. They do not change us. The dog wags the tail. The tail does not wag the dog. One wonders why the name of the alleged AIDS virus has undergone so many name changes. HIV-1 was known as HTLV-3, human T-cell leukemia virus, and as LAV, lymphadenopathy-associated virus, 
and was probably renamed because the, Ameri- because the American and French scientists continue to squabble over who, quote, owns the cause of AIDS. Because remember, there is great profit in owning this virus, as the great Gallo scandal has pointed out. The date, to date rather, there is no evidence that the HIV-1 plays any role in the cause of AIDS. HIV-1 is found everywhere in the body. It has been found almost everywhere in the world. Its rate of infectivity is less than 1%. It has been around well before 1980 and may have been around for centuries or more. And remember that we all make our own viruses. Why has this one been picked upon as the alleged cause of AIDS? Retroviruses, of which HIV is a member, were very popular subjects for research and research grants during the early 80s. They have been trying to implicate them in some human cancers, and there certainly is money available for cancer research. The data, however, shows the retroviruses to be opportunistic, as are the other germs listed in Figure 15, and I'm going to read Figure 15 for you later. Certain viruses often appear in very sick people and are not specific in any disease association. HIV-1 seems to be in cells everywhere in the body, blood, brain, spinal fluid, saliva, tears, etc. Thus, it is not T-cell specific as was originally claimed. Now remember, folks, they're trying to tell you that HIV goes into your T-cells and knocks out your immune system through your T-cells, and that is a bold-faced lie. HIV not only appears to be everywhere in the world, but appears to be totally different in different locations and to be a whole spectrum of different viruses. In fact, the more you look, the more variants you find. Not surprising, since different people make different viruses. In a totally no-risk group of Aboriginal Indians from Venezuela with almost no contact with civilizations, HIV was found, not only widening its occurrence, but suggesting that this virus has been around for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. The only correlating factor in this tribe was the association with malaria, which is also an immunosuppressive illness. Again, it appears that HIV only appears in sick people and does not cause them to be sick. Constantly, throughout much of the literature, it has been suggested that other factors, quote-unquote, play a role in AIDS. But these admonitions seem to be ignored as the money and technology in medicine gears up for another decade of HIV testing, HIV drugs, and HIV vaccines, even though there is no scientific evidence that these avenues will be worthwhile. Now remember, folks, practically every report I have seen from the CDC and from the National Institute of Health tell you that AIDS has no cure, and yet in the same breath they will tell you that drugs like AZT, DDL, and other things are effective. I hope you will take the time to check out the research because you will get a good laugh one day. Viruses are not alive and are made by us. One should understand that the search for viruses is not an easy task. They cannot be seen or in any way be directly shown to exist in any sample of human tissue. For this reason, virtually all viral research is dependent upon coaxing viruses to be made by cells in grossly abnormal tissue cultures. None of these findings or results can actually be extrapolated to processes involved in human health or disease. In fact, all tissue culture-derived data, while perhaps interesting, has absolutely no valid application in the study of health or human disease. It is most likely, as with most germs grown on artificial media, that viruses isolated and blamed for AIDS do not even exist in the humans with the syndrome. In fact, they are most likely artifacts of the involved process of repeated transfers of material from various tumor cells grown in synthetic environment using synthetic nutrients. Any good microbiologist or virologist would tell you that germs identified by tissue culture techniques bear little resemblance to the original tissue plus germ sampled. So folks, we're saying that when we are isolating viruses for AIDS research, we are not looking at the actual thing that is in the human beings. And this is something that I know because I have been in the field of microbiology, and I know this 
the stuff that we're saying about AIDS here in this particular case is absolutely true because it is backed by a lot of data, but it's unfortunately data that you do not read about in the Times. The comment about the quote-unquote long-term incubation of HIV also proves that the virus has always been with us and only proliferates when a person becomes ill. If you get a cold, a cold today, does that mean that you actually caught the cold virus last week, last year, or 50 years ago? Germs don't incubate. They are always there and only awaiting a situation in which they are needed. After seven years of waiting, only 133 cases of AIDS have been shown out of 13,000 reported alleged infected heterosexual transfers. Does that sound like a high infectivity or incubation period? The recent false report published in April of 93 of those little HIV, HIVs busy inside lymph nodes is complete nonsense because that is where most of your lymphocytes hang out and that's where you would expect to find the HIV healing message. A very wise doctor admitted that medicine is still not sure of the role of the virus that is involved in AIDS and that they should not use any treatment experimentally. He said, quote, initial enthusiasm over any new treatment should not obscure the need for considered, considered evaluation over time. The triumph of enthusiasm over time produced the only Nobel Prize ever offered in psychiatry in 1949 for the frontal lobotomy. What about the monkey AIDS called SAIDS? Well, they have been trying to blame the African monkey as well as the people of Africa for starting this supposed epidemic, but there is no proof except that sick monkeys can get similar viruses to appear. Now, finally, to totally dispute any role for HIV and AIDS, the following list sums up all the scientific evidence against the AIDS-HIV hypothesis. These points were gleaned from the works of Dr. Duesberg, that's Dr. Peter Duesberg, folks, who published an extensive review with 278 references, also from Dr. Jonas, Dr. Ruth Bernstein, and many others, all of which clearly showed why HIV could not possibly be responsible for AIDS as the group for scientific investigation of the AIDS-HIV hypothesis has been saying for years. I'm going to start reading this list, folks. You are going to like it. I have referenced every single thing I'm about to read here. It is true. It is fact. And I hope you will pay very close attention. One, 97% of U.S. AIDS cases come from abnormal risk groups, i.e., IV drug abusers, male homosexuals who use toxic drugs, hemophiliacs, crack babies and crack mothers, recipients of blood products, etc. Healthy people with normal health risk do not get AIDS. Two, less than 5% of AIDS patients with symptoms are carriers of HIV. Evidence of HIV is not found in all AIDS cases. According to the CDC, you can have AIDS without any evidence of HIV. That's like being convicted of murder with no evidence being required. Folks, I hope you heard this. The CDC says that you can have AIDS without HIV, and yet millions and millions of dollars are being made out there to test people for HIV and give them a death sentence and drive them to the grave just from the weight and the heavy pressure of carrying around a HIV-positive test. But remember, I just told you that the CDC itself will tell you that AIDS does not mean you will have the HIV virus in you. And that's true, because right now, there are more than 5,000 cases, diagnosed cases of AIDS, allegedly, people, 5,000 people walking around the United States who have been told they have AIDS, who have been clinically shown to have AIDS, according to the modern medical establishment, and yet who have not one single trace of the HIV virus. Think about that, folks. Think about that very carefully. Number three, HIV would have to produce all of its symptoms in a few days to a few weeks. HIV has no genes to enable it to incubate for the alleged 10 or more years. Four, 91% of all AIDS victims are males. If sex transmission were actually occurring, then females should have the same rate of AIDS. Both pregnancy and other sexually transmitted diseases have been on the rise 
for the past 10 years. So women should be at least half of the AIDS cases, but they are not. Five, AIDS is equal to about 50 other diseases in its pathology and in its symptomology. Yet many of these diseases are not induced by immune deficiency. And we're talking about Carpacy sarcoma, lymphomas, wasting disease, dementia, and autoimmune illnesses. Nor are these diseases caused by microbes. And yet, the symptomology, the description of symptoms, which they call AIDS, is identical to these diseases, which, on the other hand, do not have any link to any microbes or any germ infection. Six, most HIV-positive people remain healthy for 10 years and probably will live much longer. Seven, seven, another interesting fact. Many carpathy sarcoma and pneumocystis carini pneumonia patients have no HIV in them. Eight, the HIV-positive American male homosexuals have 20 times the risk of carpathy sarcoma than all other risk groups. This suggests additional toxic factors. Okay, folks, we're going to take a break here. Let Bill take his break, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, back to this amazing little list. Number nine, even when dying of AIDS, the HIV test can be negative. And since HIV is present in about one of every 10,000 T-cells, why are T-cells still disappearing even after HIV is gone? 10. Since you produce antibodies to HIV, how could you get sick after establishing your immunity? Many have classic immunity with antibodies and no HIV. Now, understand this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. We have set up most of the current AIDS test to test for the antibody. Um, now, usually, if you know any basic biology, when you have an antibody, it means your body is already fighting the disease. So, when we are shown to have antibodies to HIV, how could you get sick after having established your immunity? It's the same scam as we talked about with vaccines. Now, again, let me read this part. Many people have classic immunity with antibodies and no HIV. Now, think about that. 11. Chimpanzees and accidentally inoculated healthcare workers, some 20,000, have not developed AIDS. Folks, that's documented fact. I'll bet you didn't know that. 12. Why are there significant geographical differences? In Europe and the U.S., most cases are homosexuals. In Africa and South America, most cases are heterosexual. How does the HIV know what sexual, sexual preference people have? How could the alleged modes of transmission be so widely different from culture to culture? 13. Also, people in different risk groups and different countries get different symptoms. In the U.S., we see pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, carpathy sarcoma, and candidiasis. In Africa, we see slim disease, fever, diarrhea, and TB. Even though pneumocystis carini pneumonia and candida is found in all people. 14. Cannot isolate the virus in 20 to 50 percent of AIDS diagnosed people. Now, isn't that interesting? Think about that, folks. Think about what modern medicine tells you. They tell you if you have the disease, you must have the germ, and we're telling you right here, according to referenced scientific research that 20 to 50 percent of the AIDS cases are there, but you cannot isolate the virus in them. You figure it out. 15. Retroviruses like HIV do not kill T cells. In fact, they promote cell growth and proliferation of T cells. Even in tissue culture, T cells can produce prodigious numbers of HIV far more than possible in any AIDS patient, and the T-cells are never harmed. Let me read that to you again, because you have been told that AIDS is out there destroying your T-lymphocytes. That it's the crux of what AIDS is doing, and that's why you develop some kind of alleged immune suppression. Listen. Retroviruses like HIV do not kill T-cells. In fact, they promote cell growth and proliferation of T-cells. Even in tissue culture, T cells can produce prodigious numbers of HIV and the T cells are never harmed. 
16. There are no AIDS cases where HIV presence is the only immunosuppressive factor. In fact, all AIDS cases have one or more known causes of immunodeficiency, including exposure to blood transfusions, excessive exposure to semen, excessive use of addictive recreational drugs, chronic or high doses of antibiotics, antivirals, antiparasitic agents, anti-inflammatories, anesthetics, opiate analgesics, antidepressants, surgical trauma, injury trauma, multiple recurrent viral diagnoses, malnutrition, lympho, lymphocytotoxic autoimmunity, etc. 17. Some HIV negative people in risk groups are more immunosuppressive and sick than HIV positive individuals in the matched group with correlations to immunosuppressive factors. So folks, the correlation with the symptoms listed under the umbrella of acquired immune deficiency syndrome are more correlated to these risk factors that I just read a few seconds ago than to the HIV virus. 18. Prior immunosuppression needs to be present to lead to HIV positive, meaning that an unhealthy state is a prerequisite, what used to be called lack of resistance or increased susceptibility. 19. Many cases of AIDS, by all criteria of the CDC, are HIV negative. That's my favorite. I hope you'll think about that one carefully, folks. 20. HIV is supposed to be new, but many confirmed clinical cases can be identified going back to the 19th century and earlier to the 16th century. 21. Female prostitutes who are drug abusers have a high incidence of HIV-positive diagnoses, yet prostitutes who are not drug abusers show almost zero incidence of HIV-positive, indicating non-sexually transmitted factors. Over 85% of all AIDS cases involve drug abuse. Now, folks, that doesn't just mean it's from people injecting and it's spread by the blood, because I've already shown you that that's nonsense. The drug abuse is the key. That is an immunosuppressive factor. Remember, germs don't cause disease. The disease causes germs. 22. You can find HIV in only about 10 to 30 percent of HIV positive gay men. So how could it be transmitted by sperm as once alleged? 23. Many people revert from HIV positive to HIV negative and remain healthy. And this, again, suggests other multiple factors. I'll bet you didn't know that, folks. Well, I know some of these people personally. 24. Every AIDS case shows positive tests for autoimmune reactions, indicating significant tissue breakdown caused by toxic and malnourishing exposures. Symptoms correlate with chronic autoimmune diseases, not infectious diseases. Symptoms correlate with chronic autoimmune diseases, not infectious diseases. Now, what this means, folks, is that AIDS is not an infectious disease. It is something, an umbrella of symptoms that correlate highly with a number of different factors that are linked to immunosuppression. But it has nothing to do with HIV, and it has nothing to do with an infectious disease that is, quote-unquote, spread. 25. 25. There exist more than 800 HIV-negative immunodeficiencies and AIDS-defining diseases in all major American and European AIDS risk groups. And... 2,200 HIV-negative African AIDS cases that meet all the World Health Organization's criteria for diagnosis of AIDS. These are the recently described mystery AIDS cases explained. Now, I hope you will think about that. I hope you're getting this on tape because I know some of this is hard to grasp the first time. 26. Only about 50% of AIDS cases as reported by the Center for Disease Control are confirmed HIV positive. Much of the remainder may be HIV negative. And I know why Bill Holler wrote this this way, because in my own efforts to decipher and get AIDS research data from the CDC, you will find that they do not publish any of their data 
any of their results. They publish you conclusions. Anything the CDC puts out about AIDS would never be accepted even into the most lax scientific journals. Think about that, folks. 27. HIV violates infectious disease rules used for over a century, which are conscious postulates. Because no viral traces can be found in many AIDS patients, and one of the basic tenets of Koch's postulate is that if you have the disease, you must have the germ. And that is simply not the case in AIDS, and, believe it or not, not the case in almost every example of alleged infectious diseases. 28. HIV isolation is completely artificial, and it bears no resemblance to the systems of a living human being. You cannot even find the virus in most AIDS cases. 29. HIV infects a very small number of T-cells, which is about 1 in 10,000, and it has no capacity to destroy any of them. They would be replaced faster than they would be lost. Retroviruses are not cytocidal, which means they do not kill cells, and they actually promote cell growth. Now remember, Everyone out there is telling you that AIDS is a retrovirus and that it is killing your T lymphocytes and that's why you get suppressed immunity. Well, it's all nonsense. 30. There are two viruses claimed to cause AIDS, HIV-1 and HIV-2, which have a 60% different structure. Rapid evolution of multiple viruses causing the same disease are highly, highly improbable. These works and others cast serious doubt on whether HIV can indeed kill lymphocytes and suppress immunity. Yet almost everyone in America believes that HIV is the cause of AIDS. Why? It is a simple use of propaganda phrases, slogans, and the media. As in Hitler's Germany, it was realized that if you repeat a lie loud and often enough, people will eventually believe it. This is what has happened in America today and it is called advertising or brainwashing. So if you keep listening to the mass media, you will chant HIV equals AIDS over and over in your mind like Winston tastes good like a cigarette should, along with many other slogans. There is an interesting alternate hypothesis for viral action in disease states. It is very possible that viruses play an intercellular communicative role in the repair and regeneration of damaged tissues in the human being. It seems that a large section of the HIV virus's external envelope is almost identical to a substance naturally occurring in our bodies. This substance is called neuroleukin, and it is one of many cytokine, cytokines like interferon, interleukin, etc. Factors which are involved in the repair of damaged nerve cells and other tissues. Do you really think that this is all a coincidence? We make all viruses, ladies and gentlemen. There are much more active viruses associated with AIDS. For example, cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr, which are both present in over 95% of AIDS patients, contribute to virulent pneumonias. Folks, the AIDS label can be applied to any individual who has any acute or even asymptomatic infection, any persistent swelling of lymph glands, any chronic constitutional illness, any neurologic pathology, any secondary infection, any secondary cancer, and other things, with or without a confirmatory test. In general, 40 to 60 percent stated causes of death are largely incorrect, based upon the most accurate form of diagnosis, the autopsy. With all causes of death being so poorly identified by physicians, imagine the error rate in the diagnosis of AIDS. Accumulating evidence suggests that AIDS is essentially a new name being applied to a wide variety of old illnesses, and that the so-called AIDS or HIV tests may be no more than tests for any chronic illness. Both the diagnostic criteria and several laboratory tests that are supposedly specific for AIDS have shown very close correlations to hypogammaglobulin anemia, post-bone marrow transplant reactions, lupus, carcinoid tumors, neurologic pathology related to nutritional deficiencies, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, tuberculosis, malaria, leukemia, and 35 other common infections, all autoimmune diseases such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Graves disease, thyroiditis, and other diseases including a hundred other descriptions. Now, what does this all mean? 
It means that most of the AIDS tests out there don't test for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. They test for an antibody to this virus, which has been shown by almost every piece of research out there, does not cause anything called AIDS. So, folks, if you are ever coaxed into taking an HIV test, please do not do it. They are inaccurate. HIV does not cause what we are calling AIDS in the first place. And most of the tests out there will test positive for a number of other diseases. Understand this well. This is documented fact. And if you leave here with anything tonight, I hope you will leave with the understanding that you should not get any AIDS test. It is nonsense. It is absolutely absurd. And you will be asking for trouble, as you will see in the next few minutes. In the early days of AIDS, one claim diagnostic test was the decrease in helper suppressor T cells. This test could not verify AIDS because almost all infection caused these same results. Later, it was shown that this decrease in helper suppressor cells occurs with equal frequency in homosexuals who do not test positive for AIDS. Thus, the test is not specific for AIDS, only for any general illness. It also has no prognostic value and does not mean one has suppressed immunity. Other tests that appear told the same story. Thymosin alpha-1, neopterin, beta macroglobulin, Energy, CD4, etc., all claim to be surrogate markers for AIDS, but all have been subsequently shown to be positive in most chronic illnesses. The many generations of currently available tests are fraught with major problems, making them all useless and dangerous. A partial list of severe problems associated with AIDS testing follows. 1. The tests have a very large false positive rate falsely identifying a patient as having AIDS when in fact they do not. This percentage rate ranges from 40 to 500 percent, with many false positives in women. The ability to accurately identify the syndrome is usually less than 20 percent. Today's tests suffer from a 97 to 99 percent false positive rate in no-risk screening applications. Swallow that, folks. Believe it, it is true, it is fact, I have verified it. Two, the tests are positive in many cases of alcoholism, malaria, and any autoimmune disease, including arthritis and 200 other illnesses. Three, the tests will show false positives if the blood sample is heated, frozen, stored for a long time, or not allowed to fully clot. In fact, 95% who test positive have absolutely no virus present. I hope you are all getting pissed off out there, folks, and I hope if any of you out there have ever gotten any kind of HIV test that you are fuming right now because you have been totally fooled. Four, the supposedly more specific virus tests, which are more expensive, less sensitive, and more prone to lab error, hence have large false positives and false negative rates. Now, even one of the most accepted tests that's supposed to be confirmatory for the HIV virus, the Western blot, sure, it'll, it'll tell you in certain low percentages of cases when that virus is present. But folks, I think from what I have read up until today and in today, you will have at least a doubt as to whether HIV even causes AIDS. I know it does not. I hope you have a doubt in your mind, and I hope you will go out and verify this for yourself. Get it, folks. Get it in your heads. HIV testing is a scam. HIV does not cause AIDS. The tests are totally inaccurate and have incredibly high false positive and false negative rates. The little section here that Bill Holub did showing that um, if HIV is present in about one per thousand people, and it's nowhere near this, by the way, and let's say that a test claims 98% reliability to identify the HIV virus, and again, there's not one test that is this high, this means that the test misses 2% of HIV positive people and falsely identifies 2% as having HIV positive. Now, you take this test, what is the prob probability of it correctly identifying HIV in you? 
Did you say 98%? Well, you are dead wrong. The correct answer is 4.7%. So you have a 4.7% chance of being identified as HIV positive correctly and a 95.3% chance of being falsely identified as being HIV positive. And he goes into explaining it. I won't go into it now, but it's all very <laughs> correctly done statistically. I hope, I hope you will leave this show tonight with the understanding that you do not need any kind of HIV testing, that what we are calling AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, is not acquired, it is not an immune deficiency, and it has nothing to do with that damn virus that they are calling HIV. I'm going to have to start to wind down here and continue on this train of thought in the next show, tomorrow night's show. Let me read you from one of my favorite articles that I picked out of the New York Times, uh, the national circulation issue, uh, Friday, October 9th, 1992. <laughs> it's a very interesting article because it appears with a wrong headline. It's actually under the title, New Tool for Detecting Dark Matter, and it talks about um, stuff going out in the universe. But it opens as follows. Scientists have found five people who were infected with the virus that causes AIDS by blood transfusion from one donor and then did not develop any evidence of illness seven to ten years later. Now, the normal person would think, ah, well, that would mean that AIDS, or rather HIV, does not cause AIDS. But you know what the genius who wrote this article wrote? This suggests that it was a non-virulent strain. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the article because it's a bunch of nonsense. But you can get an idea of what kind of purposely created stupidity there is out there regarding this disease. And you read it in the Times and you believe it. Burns me, folks. Really burns me. Folks, this is just the start. Um, tomorrow night's show, I'm going to bring you up into the present moment with information uh, relating to what is really going on in Africa what is going on with the alleged cases of women developing AIDS and the cases of children. And I am going to read you excerpts from two of the most important nationally published articles that I have yet found on the subject. And you are going to be floored. Because if you do not believe little old me telling you what I have been telling you for the last couple of shows, you will hear information tomorrow that is going to blow your mind, that is right out of some of the top people in the scientific community and published in national magazines. But I'm sure, if you weren't keeping your eyes open, that you did not find this stuff. And it happened very recently. Well, folks, I hope you will join us tomorrow. Um, tomorrow will be a very important show. It's important to me. I want you to get the word out that you do not have to be scared by this alleged acquired immune, immune deficiency syndrome stuff. I don't want you to leave this show confused. I want you to have a very clear understanding in your mind. HIV does not cause AIDS. There is no bug out there creating this disease. People are going to be dying. It's part of the plan. They're going to blame AIDS, they're going to blame HIV, but that is to cover the truth. And hopefully in a future show, I am going to tell you exactly how your food, your air, and your water is being poisoned, and that is where you are developing these diseases. I already told you about inoculations, that's one part, but there's a lot more. Tune in tomorrow though, folks, to get the last word on AIDS. I hope you'll be there. Again, if you want to hear anything or... Uh, Rather, if you want to get anything from me, research information, point you in the right direction for finding sources, you want to uh, argue with me by the mail, please feel free to do so. You can write to me, Alex Loglia, L-O-G-L-I-A, 217 East 85th Street, Suite 246, New York, New York, 10028. Take care, folks. Good night. And I hope we'll have you listening in tomorrow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm back again tonight for my last installment on the subject of 
acquired immune deficiency syndrome. I've covered a lot of ground over the last couple of nights, both with the germ theory and with AIDS. And tonight, I want to bring this all to a head to get some points across to you that are very important to me. I'm going to read you a little bit more from Bill Holub's work and quote you some articles that are going to be supporting what I'm saying here. I did back on show before last tell you that I was going to tell you about Africa, about AIDS cases in women and children. So, here we go. This is from Bill Holub, who I've mentioned enough for you to know already. The evidence is overwhelming that a major factor in AIDS is chronic malnutrition, yet this is selectively ignored by the media and the medical community. Figure 22, which is some picture here, you see, describes the major clinical features of AIDS, which also happen to be the exact same list of the major clinical features of classic protein calorie malnutrition, whose acronym is PCM which is the only major disease process occurring in the underdeveloped countries and in the homeless starving people of America. Actually, the U.S. now qualifies as a socially undeveloped and over-medicated country. It is astonishing to note that all the symptoms of AIDS are identical to the symptoms of classic protein calorie malnutrition. With regard to transfusions, the situation is similar. Transfusions like immunizations or the introduction into the body of foreign proteins is a very potent immune challenge. If this immune challenge is given to someone ill, malnourished, etc., then rapid immunosuppression follows. And remember what I told you in my show about vaccinations. Thus, the chronic infection seen after transfusions as is the subsequent immune depression and the AIDS-like syndrome are due to other clinical factors and not to the HIV slash AIDS virus. Now, reading on, women as 50% of the consumers need to be duped into the AIDS myth. The first few cases were described in women who were called, quote, previously healthy, and yet if you looked at their clinical history, you wondered what previously healthy means. These women had long histories of drug abuse, chronic infections, anemia. In other words, they were frequently sick and frequently medicated, and that is how they developed the symptoms called AIDS. The media continues to whip up paranoia, fear, prejudice, and vengeful anger into the public maelstrom of AIDS. There is the classic story of the two women who received transfusions who were later told that they would get AIDS and die. One stayed well, and medicine termed her lucky. The other got sick, and they termed her AIDS. What would happen to you if you were told, and you believed it, that you were going to die and to keep coming back to the hospital for tests and treatments for years while you and medicine wait for the signs of the deadly disease? Most people would probably get very sick under such stress. There was also a sad testimonial to the media when a foster mother let her son die because she was afraid that he got AIDS in the hospital. Children victimized by the AIDS medical machine. In children, AIDS is detected and treated the same way as it is in adults, so the outcome is the same. But the percent supposedly infected that go on to get AIDS is very small, so again, other factors have been suggested. In, G in these children, the quote-unquote therapy is just as aggressive and just as lethal. About 90% of supposed maternal transmissions of AIDS can be accounted for because the women are usually drug abusers and were very sick and very medicated before and after birth. Remember, whatever a pregnant woman does to herself and whatever medicine does to her is also done to the unborn baby. So, this, so is this really showing transmission of disease or simply continued toxic care? Folks... In one study, children with AIDS showed the following associations when compared to a group without AIDS. 200% more injections, 31% more transfusions, 60% more surgery, 96% more vaccinations, 59% longer hospital stays, and 31% more transfusions. Folks, this is the correlative data, meaning that the children who had AIDS had these cofactors. Thus, it seems that the more treatment you get, the more likely you are to get sick and to be labeled as having AIDS. 
The media has put false fear into the public by saying that breastfeeding transmits AIDS, even though the one quoted case had no evidence to show of any transmission. We presume that the infant formula companies will, will love this propaganda. Now, an unusual exchange occurred in the medical literature recently in which American medical people keep insisting that Africa was the source of the AIDS virus while African scientists could not substantiate this claim. There was no evidence of any significant positive tests, and the tests which did show positive had a high correlation to previously mentioned protein calorie malnutrition, malaria, Burkitt's lymphoma, and other diseases of chronic malnutrition. These correlations are sufficient to explain the high rate of false positives. Much misinformation and disinformation has been reported about AIDS in Africa. Following a six-week tour of 26 cities and towns in 16 sub-Saharan countries, physician Felix Cotney Ahulu of the Cromwell Hospital London observed that press statements were grossly exagger exaggerated. He found, quote, Uppermost in the minds of intelligent Africans and Europeans was the question, why do the world's media appear to have conspired with some scientists to become so gratuitously extravagant with the untruth? This journalistic hyperbole has proved very expensive. Africans overseas have experienced racial abuse, tourism has unjustly suffered, and tension seems to have developed between white doctors working in Africa. Many whites with a fund of goodwill for Africa feel even more strongly than I do about the effect of the world's media on that continent. Africa's only really endemic diseases are malnutrition, environmental degradation, social political wars, poverty, poor hygiene, and unhealthy sexual practices. Africa has the highest percent of the population suffering from chronic malnutrition. That is, about 168 million people, which is 33%, compared to the Far East of 19%, Latin America, 13%, and the Near East, 12%. Of course, if our government were honest with us, our country would be right up there with the worst. The black African prejudice concerning AIDS may be shifting to the black American as race becomes an issue. Witness a report claiming to find new abnormal facial features in children born to mothers tested positive for AIDS. The report was sub subsequently shown to be false because the investigators did not realize that features such as flat nasal bridge, prominent forehead, prominent lips, and slanted eyes are observed with a certain degree of frequency in normal black and Hispanic children and could hardly be considered abnormal. Folks. I hope that gives you some idea of what's going on here. The only real reason that we may be seeing AIDS in Africa, aside from what I have just read, is smallpox vaccination programs that were there a while back. Now, some of the more radical people out there will tell you that the smallpox vaccinations were actually either laced with AIDS or were precursors of AIDS, and personally, from the data I've seen, it's nonsense, and from the data I have seen, and the work I've done with vaccinations, you do not even need a killer virus to be put into these vaccines to create these kind of immunosuppressive problems and symptoms. Folks, like I said on my vaccination show, vaccinations alone are enough to produce all the immunosuppressive symptoms in people years after they've received the vaccination. That's fact. I don't know anybody who will argue that with you after they see the data. Now, also from some of the data that uh, my friend Bill Holub has <laughs> put together, first-year profits and sales for AIDS tests. Let me just read you the company names and the profits they've made and the first-year sales. Electronucleonics, 56.9 million sales in AIDS tests. Baxter Travanol, 1.8 billion. Abbott Laboratories, 3.1 billion. Centicor, 10.9 million. This is all first year sales figures for companies that produce AIDS tests. Now, Bill Holub also has some fantastic data, which I can't really go into uh, in detail. But suffice it to say, through careful statistical analysis, he has shown uh, dozens of other diseases that have been renamed as AIDS and shown you the number of lost cases of those diseases that have been renamed as AIDS. I'm looking right at it. 
a little bit too complicated of a chart to read to you, but suffice it to say, folks, the data is here. It has been published. It exists. It is documented. It is very carefully referenced. Some other stuff here that I can read to you, which is interesting. Other diseases, other disease states of which can now also be renamed or reclassified as AIDS, and this is from data from the Center for Disease Control. Listen to what they are calling AIDS now, folks. Tuberculosis, salmonella, any my mycobacterial disease, reticulosarcoma, any malignant lymphoma, any encephalop encephalopathy, any dementia, any weight loss, diarrhea, malnutrition, any recurrent or multiple bacterial infections, candidasis, cryptococcosis, cryptococcosis, cytomegalovirus disease, herpes simplex disease, Kaposi sarcoma, lymphoma of the brain, lymphoid, interstitial pneumonia, mycobacterium avium complex. I'm not going to go on. I hope you get the picture. I really hope you get the picture, folks. Let me read a little bit from an article from February 5th Times of this year of 1993. Um, it's titled, Epidemic of AIDS in Africa, a Tragic Myth. And then again, it's the... London Sunday Times, and this is by Neville Hodgkins. I'm just going to read you some of the stuff I've underlined just for fun. Africa is not in the grip of an AIDS epidemic, and false assertions that the continent is being devastated by HIV are leading to a tragic diversion of resources from genuine medical needs. Some of the heretics even maintain there is no evidence of a new sexually transmitted disease in Africa. Where death rates have increased, they say, it is because of civil war, poverty linked to economic decline, and growing use of hard drugs. Professor Peter Duesberg, the University of California virologist, argues that HIV is harmless and does not cause AIDS. According to the World Health Organization, 7.5 million people are infected with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that AIDS will be killing 500,000 people a year there by the end of the century. Dr. Harvey Bialy, a leading American scientist with long experiences in Africa who accompanied the television crew, says there is absolutely no believable pervasive evidence that Africa is in the midst of a new epidemic of infectious immunodeficiency. Because international funds are available for AIDS and HIV work, politicians and health workers have an incentive to classify people as AIDS sufferers. Folks, I hope this sounds like something I spoke to you about in reference to vaccinations, false diagnosis, and renaming of diseases. Quote, Fear of AIDS is having almost as great an effect as AIDS itself. People are frightened of going to see a doctor because they believe they will be diagnosed as having AIDS and feel condemned to death. It has become a joke in Uganda that you are not allowed to die of anything but AIDS. Bialy said last week, a favorite story is that a friend has just been run over by a car and doctors put it down as AIDS-related suicide. I heard it from the doorman at our hotel in Kampala. He was laughing, saying that AIDS was supposed to be sexually transmitted. Yet in his five years there, the prostitutes who came to the bar were exactly the same. None of them had become sick. What is new is that these girls are addicted to viciously adulterated smokable heroin and cocaine. And again, Bialy, the scientific editor of Biotechnology, which is a sister publication to the Science Journal Nature, uh, has been visiting Africa since 1975. Um, he says, the only utterly new phenomenon I have seen is the drug-using prostitutes in Abidjan and the Ivory Coast. He said, these girls come from Ghana, from families of prostitutes who are brought in by the busloads. They've been doing this for generations and never became sick until now. And again, what I just stopped reading is, what is new is that these girls are addicted to viciously adulterated, smokable heroin and cocaine. It completely destroys them. They look exactly like the inner-city crack-addicted prostitutes of the United States. Bialy says part of the problem is that HIV testing is frequently misleading in Africa. Well, let me add, it's totally misleading in the United States. He continues, The tests react to antibodies to malaria as well as HIV, producing up to 80 per to 90% false positives. This is the vast, there's vast literature showing this. Just so you know that I'm not making this up, folks. 
Most AIDS diagnoses in Africa do not involve an HIV test, but are based on World Health Organization definitions based on clinical signs, including weight loss, chronic diarrhea, and prolonged fever. I just read those to you a few minutes ago from Dr. Bill Holland. A recent study in The Lancet from Japanese doctors working in Ghana reported that out of a group of 227 diagnosed AIDS patients, <coughs> excuse me, who had all, th all three of these signs, as well as other AIDS-related conditions, 59% showed no trace of HIV in their blood. For the past seven years, uh, and we're talking about a doctor here, uh, Professor Beverly Griffin, Director of Virology at the Royal Postgraduate Med School, Medical School in Hammersmith Hospital. For the past seven years, she has received blood samples of hundreds of children in Malawi, the proportion that are HIV positive has remained unchanged at 1 to 2 percent. This casts doubt, she feels, on the claims elsewhere that Malawi is in the grip of an HIV epidemic with about a fifth of its population infected. And again, folks, that, and let me correct what I said at the beginning of reading. This is not from the New York Times. It's from the March 21st, 1993 issue of the London Sunday Times. I, I hope this is... Uh, made some impact on you, and I hope you've heard what I've said here, folks. We're in the midst of a big scam. I want to get right into this, because time is of the essence. I am now going to read you excerpts from the article that appeared in this month's, actually, no, it's still this month's, because it's September now that I'm doing this, September issue of Spin Magazine, and we are talking about an interview with Dr. Peter Duesberg. Uh, with Bob Guccione Jr. in Spin Magazine. I hope you can still go out and get it. And if you can't go out and get it, get the October one, because the October issue is just as good. It's got another article that I will be reading from as well. Duesberg's credentials are impeccable. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of an outstanding investigative grant from the National Institutes of Health in 1985. He was a candidate for the Nobel Prize for his work in discovering oncogenes, thought to be a cause of cancer. But he derailed his chance of winning when he cautioned that his findings did not prove that there were cancer genes in cells, as was popularly theorized at the time, and it is still an unproven theory. An insane move for a scientist's career, but an exemplary act of ethics. Now, Dr. Duesberg, I have been studying his work personally for the last five or six years. It is impeccable. This man has integrity. He is brave. He is not out there trying to find research money. And here's what he has to say about AIDS in an interview with Bob Guccione Jr. in uh, September Spin Magazine, starting on page 96. Spin. Why do you think HIV doesn't cause AIDS? Duesberg. Every virus I've seen gets its job done by killing a cell at a time. And when it is killed enough, you get sick. HIV is said to be responsible for the loss of T cells, which are the immune system. Now, in every AIDS patient studied so far, there is never more than, on average, one in 1,000 cells infected by HIV. How many cells in 1,000 would, would another virus infect, for instance, a flu virus? If it would cause flu, then 30% of your lung cells are ruined by the virus, the lining is gone or infected. If you have hepatitis, almost every single cell in your liver is infected. Spin. A lot of very bright scientists are working in AIDS, and they don't have all the dubious agendas, and they must have asked themselves the same questions. If HIV doesn't kill a lot of cells, why is it widely believed to be the cause of AIDS? Duesberg. By assigning it all these unprecedented, paradoxical properties that no other virus ever had. They say it can kill cells indirectly or can induce something called autoimmunity, which essentially is the virus sends out a trigger and the body is now convinced to commit suicide. Or they say there are cofactors, if you really press them hard on it. But what they are has yet to be determined. How feasible is the argument that HIV triggers autoimmunity? It is very implausible indeed. There are a million Americans with HIV who are totally healthy. There are 6 million Africans, according to the World Health Organization, who have HIV. 129,000 had AIDS by the end of last year. That means 5,800,000 and so many thousands had no AIDS. Half a million Europeans have HIV and 60,000 have AIDS. So, there are millions and millions of people on this planet who have HIV but no AIDS. 
Why don't 7.5 million get autoimmune disease if HIV is the cause of an autoimmune disease? Spin. Well, the establishment says that everybody with HIV will develop AIDS in a system matter of time. In the last 10 years, Mrs. Duesberg, this has happened in America to about 20% of all people with HIV. 250,000, including deaths to date, out of a million. But the people who are dying from AIDS are hardly ever your all-American friends of 20 to 40 years of age. Virtually all heterosexual Americans and Europeans who had AIDS are intravenous drug users. And folks, that's a fact that I have verified myself. Think about that. And the homosexuals who get AIDS had hundreds, if not thousands, of sexual contacts. That is not achieved with your conventional testosterone. It is achieved with chemicals. Those are the risk groups. They inhale poppers. They use amphetamines. They take quaaludes. They take amyl nitrate. They take co cocaine as aphrodisiacs. Spin. What is it about intravenous drug use as opposed to ordinary drug use, like snorting cocaine, that would mean these people would go on to develop AIDS? Duesberg, it's a matter of degree. With drugs, the dose is the poison. You take one aspirin, you lose your headache. You take 200, you drop dead. You smoke one pack of cigarettes, you're fine, but if you smoke two packs of cigarettes for 10 or 20 years per day, you may get emphysema. It's the same with drugs. If you snort a line of cocaine on a weekend, you probably won't notice the difference. But if you inject it intravenously two or three times a day, that's when the toxicity shows up. Back to his argument about HIV. Viruses can only work one way. They can only be toxic if they affect a the cell. They cannot work at a distance. There is no exception. Viruses are what you call an intracellular parasite. They don't have an autonomous life. They are just a little piece of information that is stuck into a cell and acts like a parasite. But outside of the cell, it's like a disk outside of a computer. Spin. Is it possible that AIDS could be an autoimmune-created disease, but HIV isn't the trigger? Duesberg. Some of the AIDS diseases could possibly be autoimmune diseases. Certainly not all. 38% of American AIDS cases have nothing to do with immune deficiency. 38%. 10% are Kaposi sarcoma. 19% are the so-called wasting disease. And then Spin goes, that is seen in Africa a lot, the slim disease. Duesberg, yes. There is, there is somewhat different. It usually is coupled with infections, but the American or European wasting disease is actually specifically defined as a non-parasitic disease. We're going to turn the tape over here, folks. Let Bill put his message on, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Continuing with Dr. Duesberg. But the American or European wasting disease is actually specifically defined as a non-parasitic disease. Anyway, 6% is dementia, 3% is lymphoma cancer. If you add those up, that's 38% of all American AIDS cases. Out of 250,000, that's about 100,000. Their diseases cannot be explained by any form of immunodeficiency whatsoever. Why is it considered AIDS then, asks Spin. That's one of the questions I would love to know the answer to. I have asked several experts. They always get mad. AIDS is always presented as if it's the immune deficiency. It is not at all. Cancer has nothing to do with immune deficiency. Spin. So what is the common denominator between all of the 25 AIDS diseases? Duesberg. None. They name it AIDS. That's all. None of these 38% have anything whatsoever to do with immunodeficiency, but they're called AIDS. That's not one AIDS disease. There's not one AIDS disease that's new. What is new is only the incidence of these diseases in 20 to 45 year old men, mostly, and a few women, which has gone up. Spin. I've always thought the 25 diseases that form the AIDS syndrome had the common denominator that they were the result of immune systems' inability to stave them off. Duesberg. Now listen to this carefully, folks. That's how they try to sell it without looking at the evidence. But cancer is not a consequence of immune deficiency, and we're talking about Kaposi sarcoma. Dementia has nothing to do with the immune system. Your brain is independent of the immune system. Of course, if there's no immune system and your brain gets infected, you can get meningitis. But it doesn't affect your IQ. Sure, in the end, if everything fails, you can get all sorts of diseases. 
Even if you accommodate the virus with all sorts of absurd and paradoxical hypotheses, indirect mechanisms, cofactors, autoimmunity, a 10-year latency period, even that doesn't get you around the solid number of 4,621 HIV-free AIDS cases worldwide, with a third of these in the United States. How do you explain those? You couldn't have a better alibi than for it not to be there. You couldn't have a better alibi, and that is suppressed. Here we have a real cover-up. Last year, the numbers of these cases was going up like crazy. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the National Institute of Health and the CDC, called a meeting. And you know what they did? They gave it a new name. They call it idiopathic CD4 lymphocytopenia, or ICL. When you're HIV-free now, folks, it's no longer called AIDS. They're going to diagnose you as having ICL. Spin. There are 4,000 cases that don't have HIV, but the 250,000 plus cases that remain do have HIV. Duisburg. That's what you think. How do you know that? Spin. Because they've been tested. Duisburg. By whom? Spin. By their physicians. Duisburg. So who tells us that they have been tested? Spin. A guy goes to his doctor, clearly very ill. He has AIDS. He's tested or was tested earlier and is found to be HIV positive. Duisburg. Even now, there is no record anywhere that says in how many American AIDS cases HIV was actually found. And you know what, folks? Dr. Duisburg is right, because I have found out exactly the same thing. Spin. But in every AIDS case, the CDC would know whether or not the patients were HIV positive because their physicians reported it. Listen carefully what Dr. Duesberg responds with. I've verified this personally. You're led to believe this by the CDC, but the evidence that HIV is there, they never disclose. Nowhere in the HIV slash AIDS surveillance report, as they call the national statistics kept by the CDC, do you ever find HIV data. No survey on HIV at all. All they talk about is AIDS, and then you read a little more of the fine print as to how AIDS is defined. They accept what you call presumptive diagnosis, AIDS cases without HIV tests. You know what that means? That means this guy wears a leather jacket, has an earring, and is coughing, and he's from San Francisco. That's an AIDS case. I don't even have to check it, his physician thinks. I recently wrote a letter to Harold Jaffe, acting director of Division of HIV slash AIDS at the CDC. He acknowledged 43,606 presumptive diagnoses up to 1988. Dr. Duesberg says he's checked the literature, and he says he's came up with 62,000 and change cases until 1992. Spin. Let me get this straight. You're saying between 43,000 and 62,000 of the cases of AIDS up until 1992 were not tested, which means we have no idea whether or not they were HIV positive? Dr. Duesberg responds, absolutely. Spin. They may or may not have been HIV positive. Duesberg, yes. Even the latest AIDS definition in January 1993, they allowed presumptive diagnosis. In other words, a good number of them, even now, will be reported without an HIV test. And folks, don't let that throw you, because as I showed on the last show, HIV testing is nonsense. Continuing. Spin. The public perception is that all cases of AIDS have HIV, that a case is not defined as AIDS without the presence of HIV, which would mean, by definition, that somebody tested them. Duesberg. Most people assume, like you, that everyone with AIDS is positive, and that's not the end yet. We have what is called false positive antibody tests. They call them HIV tests. But you know what they're testing? The antibody can be there, and the virus could be long gone. I told you I wasn't making it up, folks. Spin. Additionally, there are cross-reactions, where the antibody might react, say, to malaria or th arthritis, and that's mistaken for engaging HIV. Duesberg. Exactly. 
or people vaccinated for the flu. Blood donors, 10 recently, 7 out of 10 were positive for HIV. Remember what I said, folks. Remember. There are many other diseases and reactions that will bring you a positive test for an HIV antibody, and most of the AIDS tests that are being used now, and even that shouldn't make you go out and want to get tested, because even if you find you have HIV, there are 5,000 people walking around in the world right now who have been diagnosed with AIDS and don't have a scratch of HIV in them. Now, okay. Spin, did they have the virus? Duesberg, no. Spin, how do we know they didn't have the virus? Duesberg responds, they were checked a half a year later and the test was negative. There was no virus. Every year, 12 million blood donations are checked. The donors are treated preferentially. They don't want them to get the flu, so they give them a flu vaccine free. Seven out of ten of those guys then tested after the flu vaccine turned out to be quote-unquote positive for HIV. They didn't have HIV. The flu vaccine cross-reacted with the HIV antibody. How often is the test false, asks Spin. Duesberg responds, the test can be wrong over 50% of the time. If you just repeat it, half of them fall out immediately. But if you look at a group of newly recruited soldiers, one in 100 tests positive, and when you check them again, one in 1,000 remains positive. Spin, that's pretty incredible. That means only one out of every ten that tested positive is actually positive. Duesberg, you see, that's the point. The idea that everybody who has AIDS is known to have HIV is far from the truth. There is a significant percentage who are totally untested, and the tests are often unconfirmed. And even if they are confirmed, they are only antibody tests. There are a number of people who even have a positive Western blot the most reliable antibody test. But when you look for the virus, it is still not there. Folks, I hope you're paying attention. I hope you are paying attention. I hope you will not get conned into even bothering to go out and get an AIDS test. Moving on with the interview with Dr. Duesberg. In San Francisco, there are three people, false positives, who found out now that they have no HIV but were treated with AZT, which is designed to inhibit the virus. And AZT, as we all know, is extremely toxic. And they have AIDS now. They have pneumonia. They have pneumocystis, exactly like AIDS, and they have no virus. Spin. You presume it was because of AZT? Duesberg, that's what they're suing for. Spin, explain why you have called AZT AIDS by prescription. Duesberg, it's AIDS by design. It was designed over 20 years ago as a chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is a rational but desperate treatment for cancer. The rationale is let's kill all the growing cells for several weeks. The hope is the cancer is going to be totally dead and you are only half dead and recover. Chemotherapy is a rough treatment. You lose your hair, you lose weight, you get pneumonia, you get immune deficiency, you literally get AIDS. You have nausea, you have all the AIDS symptoms because it's severe cellular intoxication. You kill a lot of good cells too. Often the treatment works, the cancer is indeed dead and you survive and recover. Now you give that drug to somebody indefinitely, not just for two or three weeks, every six hours. Your HIV positive person takes 250 milligrams of AZT. So they lose weight, they become anemic, they lose their white cells, they have nausea, they lose their muscles. Like Rudolf Nureyev, they cannot even stand on their own legs and they die, like Kimberly Bergalis, Nureyev, Arthur Ashe, Ryan White, and many others. That's what you call AIDS by prescription. There's one issue even more fundamental we scientists have never discussed. Is AIDS actually an infectious disease or not? You see, you can acquire a disease in two ways either by a microbe, and then it's an infectious disease, and then you can pass it on sexually or otherwise. Or you acquire it from the environment, that is by toxins, like you acquire lung cancer from smoking or liver cirrhosis from drinking. These are two entirely different mechanisms of getting a disease, so how do we tell them apart? 
The infectious diseases have one thing in common. Without one single exception, all infectious diseases are equally distributed between both sexes. Zero exceptions. Spin. Isn't the argument, though, that the immune system is losing the battle? The antibodies may be there, but the T cells are being depleted, so the immune system is actually losing the battle. Duisburg. Only if the virus has ever overwhelmed the immune system. But it hasn't. The immune system does beautifully. It knocks the virus out to a level where nobody can find it. Dr. Gallo and Dr. Montagnier had a hell of a time finding it because it was gone. That's why we look for the antibodies in the AIDS test. It can't find the virus. That's the third point. Again, no exceptions to that rule. Where you have an infectious disease, the microbe that is responsible for the disease is abundant and very active in many cells. Okay, spin. The argument about AIDS is that there are lots of people who do drugs and don't have AIDS. Duisburg, it's the dose. It's a genetic constituency. Some people are more resistant than others, but very roughly, it's a cumulative thing. It's a certain threshold you have to reach, and that varies personally. Now look at AIDS. It fits none of the criteria of any infectious disease. Not equally distributed, not soon manifested, no active microbe, nothing is there. You can't even find HIV if people are dying from AIDS. You can a tiny bit, but very, very occasionally. Spin. What about the 10% of AIDS patients that are women? Duisburg. Those are drug abusers, mostly. Spin. Okay, the statistics say something like 75% of the women who have some kind of recreational drug history or were HIV positive and went on HCT. That still leaves about 25% that don't have a drug history. Well, continues Duisburg, see if you talk 25%, see if you take 25% out of 10%, you're taking 2.5%. And now here we come to the definition of AIDS. AIDS is 25 old diseases under a new name in the presence of HIV. These diseases do occur with or without HIV. Spin. Is there a difference in the manifestation of, for instance, tuberculosis in a case where a woman has tuberculosis and HIV and a case where a woman just has tuberculosis? Duisburg. None that I know of. Spin. Absolutely the same, and they should, if they're both of average health, either recover or die at the same pace. Duisburg. It should be exactly the same. The only thing is that because HIV is rare in this country, only 1 in 250 Americans, or 0.4%, are HIV positive. And because it's so difficult to pick up, the odds are that he or she may be one of those people who have practiced risk behavior or been receiving transfusions. Now, let's read a little bit more here, and this I hope you'll pay very, very close attention to. Spin. What you're saying is, woman A and woman B are identically sick, so we can challenge the readership of the magazine that if anyone out there has AIDS and is HIV positive but hasn't done any risk behavior, they should contact us and let us look at their case history. And we would learn a lot if such a person who doesn't come from one of the risk groups has HIV and has developed AIDS. Have you scrutinized the case histories of any patient who has AIDS, is HIV positive, and doesn't come from a risk group? Duisburg. They are extremely rare. Those are the cases like Kimberly Bergalis. They give them AZT, and then it is finished. Spin. Did Kimberly Bergalis, the Florida woman who allegedly contracted HIV from her dentist, get AZT before or after she had AIDS? Duisburg. She had a yeast infection. That was her diagnostic disease, which is not so rare in women. And she had antibodies for the virus. Do, uh, spin. After her HIV diagnosis, they gave her AZT. She was otherwise healthy ex except for the yeast infection. Now, Alex's personal opinion is that your yeast infection, along with some other factors, will give you a false positive HIV test. But let's read on what Dr. Duesberg says. Tell me a woman with a yeast infection needs blood transfusions for anemia. Tell me a woman with a yeast infection who loses 30 pounds in a year. Tell me a woman with a yeast infection who loses her hair and needs a wheelchair because of muscle atrophy. How many women fit that description? I've heard of not one. Spin. 
And all she had at the time of prescription of AZT was a yeast infection? Are you sure of that? Duesberg. They said the yeast infection was first, and then she later also had some kind of pneumonia, and they don't say when they started her on AZT. But I have yet to ever hear of a 21-year-old that needs blood transfusions for pneumonia or a yeast infection. Spin. AZT destroys the bone marrow, doesn't it? Of course it does. It kills the red cells. Anemia is the first direct effect of AZT toxicity. If you have no red blood cells, you can't pick up oxygen. You're in trouble, my friend. Folks, I'm going to stop here with the spin article from the September issue, and I'm going to continue now with a excerpt from the article on AZT in Spin Magazine for October 1993. It's out on the stands right now. Go and get it. Um, you'll definitely like it. It discusses a recent study that has just been done that has proven, finally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that AZT is a killer drug and uh, that the original study, which was done to determine its efficacy, was done by the same company that produces the drug, which is Burroughs Welcome. Let me read you this. Uh, I think you'll find it rather entertaining. A recent Burroughs Welcome-sponsored community forum held in New York City was intended to put the Concord results into context, a euphemism for damage control. But it erupted into chaos when the audience started raising questions. Burroughs Welcome had pieced together a panel of doctors and activists to discuss, update, and reevaluate the data from the Berlin Conference. Nothing is black and white anymore, said activist Mike Barr in his opening speech. Shades of gray are everywhere, but the audience was in no mood for shades of gray. At the question and answer session, one speaker said, Hi, my name is Tom, and this is my question. Since the basis for this therapy is to destroy HIV, could you tell me what the specific keynote study is that proves HIV causes AIDS? I mean, only because it's pretty important since billions of dollars are being put into these drugs. At this point, part of the audience clapped and the other half glared angrily or sighed disgustedly. Others spoke up, their voices weak at first, then stronger. Answer the question, how do you know HIV causes AIDS? The panel moderator hemmed and hawed. I'll try to answer that, he said. It's a very complex question. The audience was impatient. Just tell us the study. Moderator, it's a complex question, and there are lots of emotions on both sides. I try to read the literature on both sides, and this is my conclusion. There are many factors associated with the progressive decay of the immune system. It depends on what kind of vocabulary you want to use. When you say something is a primary factor, and when you say something is a cofactor. Audience, could we get the name of the study, please? Moderator, the study? Okay. I'm in clinical practice, so I'll have to enlist the help of the academicians up here to see if I can give you the name of the study. Audience, but everything is based on HIV. One man asked, how can you give a drug that causes AIDS? The physician, physician's desk reference says that AZT will cause all the symptoms that are listed as AIDS symptoms. From the panel, Dr. Catherine Anastos, Director of HIV Primary Care Service at Bronx Lebanon Hospital, snapped back. There are a few bottom lines that we have to acknowledge. One is AZT does not cause AIDS. AZT can have side effects in a certain number of people that cause symptoms that are similar to those caused by the disease itself. And when you're a physician or a patient, part of the challenge is to figure out whether it's the disease or the treatment that is causing the symptoms. And if it's the treatment, then it's not worth giving. But AZT is no different from any other drug that we prescribe for any other illness in that ratio. AZT is relatively non-toxic, especially in early disease, compared to most other drugs. Compared to what? Cyanide, we heard from the audience. Her voice was drowned in the din. Barr said he wondered why all these crazy people vilifying AZT were not smart enough, quote-unquote, to see that the other two antiretrovirals, DDL and DDC, were far more toxic than AZT. Another man got up. I've been HIV positive for almost four years. Now I find out from reading biotechnology that 3 to 13 percent of Amazonian tribes in the jungle tested positive and they have no AIDS that the test reacts with all kinds of proteins that are not specific to HIV. This whole thing is a scam, and I hope to see you all at the Nuremberg trials, lady. Other members of the audience screamed at him for being rude. At this point, it seemed as if everybody was hollering at the top of his or her lungs. 
What's the name of the goddamn study that proves HIV causes AIDS? This is my life, and I've waited ten years for the answer. Someone on the panel. Uh, nobody up here actually said HIV causes AIDS. I don't think the moderator declared a 15-minute intermission at this point. Upon resumption, the audience had to write its questions on cards. The moderator read the last one. I have been HIV, HIV positive and healthy, taking no treatment for six years. Every last one of my friends who has taken AZT or other antiretroviral therapy is dead. How do you explain that? The question was dismissed. My time, folks. Folks, if you get anything from what I've been telling you over the last couple of shows, understand it's the germs don't cause disease and that AIDS is a scam and that you don't need AIDS testing because AIDS is not what people are dying from these days. I have tons more information. If you want some of it, write to me. I want to get it out to as many people as possible. Alex Loglia, L-O-G-L-I-A, 217 East 85th Street, Suite 246, New York, New York, 10028. Good night, folks. Believe nothing, verify everything, and I hope you will do something with what you've learned.